Hello, hello. Okay, so today is going to be our last day of new content with regards to Mexico. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Mexican political economy today. Um, I'm doing this not because it's going to be on the exam. It won't because um, I think it's really important that you know things about the political economy of Mexico. Just, you know, as a human being, also as a person who lives in the United States. Um, Mexico is the U.S.'s largest trade partner, so it is, uh, well, second largest. Canada, I think, edges them out a little bit. Um, but it is important for us to know our neighbors, so let us go ahead and talk a little bit about this. So, <clears throat> The first thing I want to do is talk about some general patterns that we tend to see in terms of Mexican economics, basically post-revolution. You should probably note by now that the revolution of 1910 up until about 1917 is massively influential in terms of Mexican politics, and you should probably know it pretty well here. So in terms of general patterns, first and foremost, following the revolution, following about 1917, 1920, um, the revolutionary leaders, um, um, who come to power and form the PRI decide to uh, adopt essentially a, a policy of import substitution. Um, by the late 1920s, Mexico really hadn't industrialized, like, at all. There were very few railroads. Um, there was electricity in the cities, in the countryside, very rural. Um, and so as a result, what you saw was um, this kind of push to sort of make Mexico modern. That was a massive idea behind the PRI. And the way they saw this as happening was by pushing import substitution. That is, Mexico needed to produce its own goods rather than buying them from its neighbor to the north, for example. So they adopted a policy of high tariffs, essentially protectionism, to try and protect Mexican industries and agriculture. Um, this was somewhat effective in terms of, excuse me, in terms of establishing local uh, industries. Um, for example, did you know Mexico had a booming film industry um, through the 30s up to uh, really the late 70s or so? This still does have a pretty big film industry. Um, but that was largely protected through high tariffs. Additionally, Mexico, um, through the PRI, um, really pushed for subsidized credit and energy and very, very low taxes. These were policies that made the PRI very popular among the population in general. So credit was cheap in Mexico, um, meaning that you could borrow money pretty easily. Um, the interest rates were relatively low. Um, they also subsidized the cost of energy, meaning that like essentially the way it used to work, and they've changed it a bit since, is that you played a, fat, a, a flat rate in terms of your utilities, like um, a very flat rate in terms of your electric bill every month, in terms of your water bill every month, um, no matter how much you use used. And that meant that the very wealthiest of households were paying exactly the same in terms of uh, electricity or in terms of water um, as the very, very poor. And that meant, of course, that people overused, like there was no financial like limiting factor. Um, the idea was to make it kind of like one size fits all. Um, but we talked about this with regards to taxes. Um, taxation that does that tends to hit the poor hard. Um, in general, taxes in Mexico were pretty low and they didn't do a great job of enforcement of payment. Now, that's a real problem when a lot of your policies require social expenditures. Now, during the period of pre-autocracy, during the period of sort of the, the perfect dictatorship, um, the pre does have different wings within it. Remember I talked about this when we talked about political parties, like for much of its existence, the pre wasn't left wing or right wing, it was the whole spectrum. And so that meant when the pre controlled the whole of the Mexican political system, you had different variations, kind of like different people who thought one way or another with regards to economics. So on sort of the more left-leaning side of the Pri's camp were nationalists, nacionalistas. Um, 
And they tended to focus more on sort of the socialist policies that were sort of the original core of the PRI. Remember, the PRI initially was registered as a socialist party. Um, they emphasized greater redistribution of income, higher state spending, more state involvement in parastatals. Um, they wanted to really kind of separate away from U.S. Uh, influences. Um, the U.S. was seen very much by a lot of the nationalists as sort of uh, the puppet master of um, the Western Hemisphere and that it was incumbent upon Mexico to find its own way through. Um, politicians who kind of embody this would be like Lazaro Cárdenas from the 1930s. Um, his view of kind of nationalizing the oil industry, which meant seizing oils, uh, um, oil rights from American companies, was seen as kind of like, you know, sticking it to the U.S. And then you had liberals. No, our tendency here is to think liberals left. No, that's American politics. Stop it. Liberal here as in free market liberalism, as in essentially like laissez-faire. So economic liberals within the PRI were kind of center right, and they favored a little bit more like U.S. economic policy, frankly. Um, they favored economic growth over redistribution. They wanted to see freer trade, particularly with the United States. Um, they wanted better relations with the United States in general, and they kind of favored neoliberalism as their economic principle. A lot of the liberals tended to live up in the north, and eventually many of those liberals will break away and form the PAN, the Partido Acción de la Acción Nacional, um, the National Action Party, right? And that tends to be sort of the free market economic crew. Okay, so that's kind of the background. But the big events that you really need to know about in terms of Mexican political economy, we need to talk about crisis um, and what role economic crisis has on political behavior in, uh, in Mexico, which is quite a lot. So by the end of the 1970s, Mexico was really doubling down on its resource trap. They relied incredibly heavily on their oil wealth um, to support large-scale state spending, to keep prices down. Um, the way that they subsidized their utilities and their energy spending was by using the, the oil money. Um, and they were trying to kind of like spend their way out of the chronic systems of inequality and poverty, as well as outright racism that had developed with regards to indigenous communities. But this massive amount of state spending eventually led to inflation. Um, the state spent so much and so heavily in certain areas of the economy that the peso began to devalue. And that made it more difficult for Mexico to pay its debts to foreign lenders. Um, they had borrowed some money in order to keep afloat as the oil market started to slow. And they borrowed money from a lot of different countries, but most especially from the United States. When the oil markets collapsed in 1981, which, if you're watching the news right now, is kind of happening, um, Mexico was sent into a tailspin. Um, they almost defaulted on their international loans. Like, quite literally, they had to go knocking on the doors of their various foreign lenders, hat in hand, saying, we're going to miss a deadline here. you got to help us out. Um, as a result of that, their credit rating was downgraded, and that meant that interest rates for the payment back of their loans increased. And they increased up to 24%, which really meant that Mexico just did not have the cash on hand to meet its obligations. So on the one hand, it owed money to foreign lenders. On the other hand, it owes services essentially to its own people because the PRI over the course of nearly 70 years at that point had built up this expectation that the state would provide all of these subsidized services, but they didn't really have a functioning economy capable of doing that. So presidents in the late 80s, well, mid to late 80s, both had to deal with this. Um, President de la Madrid and then Carlos Salinas de Gotari um, both pushed towards uh, neoliberal economic policies. They tended to be the economic liberals, um, and they were the ones who negotiated NAFTA. For the most part, de la Madrid was the, the initial um, instigator of negotiating NAFTA. He started it with, oh gosh... Um, would have been H.W. Bush, so Bush 41. Um, and then Carlos Salinas de Gotari um, finished it up. Uh, he did a fair bit of negotiating with, 
no, hang on, I've got this backwards. Uh, so De La Madrid would have uh, did most of the negotiating with Reagan, and then uh, Carlos Salinas de Gotari um, did most of the negotiating with H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, as a result of the fact that they were negotiating with the United States as well as Canada, which had far freer market emphasis, um, the Mexican constitution was a big stumbling block because the 1917 uh, constitution, which Mexico was definitely working under at this time um, and still is, uh, contained within it a an article, Article 27, that allowed for the seizure and redistribution of land at will by the Mexican state. And, and this was a, a push that had been put in place to kind of keep Zapatista communities in with the Constitution um, back in 1917. Um, but American businesses and Canadian businesses looked at this and were like, we're not going to invest in Mexico if we buy land or a factory or something like that. Um, the Mexican government can just seize it and then redistribute that land, which, by the way, the Mexican government totally had with regards to Pemex and oil nationalization. So that meant that it required a constitutional amendment to get rid of Article 27 um, in order to negotiate NAFTA. Ultimately, this is what happened. Um, they changed the constitution in order to um, meet obligations or insistences, uh, insistent positions from the United States and Canada. Um, and what that should tell you is that Mexico here has a limitation on its autonomy, or at least it did in the 1980s. It changed its constitution um, as a result of international like insistence. So. What this was going to do was once NAFTA would be put in place, um, it was going to get rid of a bunch of tariffs and protectionist um, institutions that existed in all three countries. Um, in Mexico, what it meant that was that cheap agricultural goods from different countries, especially from the US, flooded into the market. And the transition was not seamless. The transition between pre-NAFTA and post-NAFTA was an incredibly brutal economic transition. Um, when we try to figure out was NAFTA good or bad, um, it, it's really, really hard to answer that question effectively depending on what measures you're looking at. Um, but in the short term, NAFTA was incredibly painful for a lot of Mexicans. Between 1994 and 1995, the value of wages in Mexico dropped by 27%. That means that everybody, no matter, like that's the average. So what that did was it just meant that all of the sudden next year you're making 27% less money while a lot of prices went up in certain areas. And that was because essentially it destabilized the agricultural market. Um, it was a really rough transition in terms of um, uh, mechanical um, and industrial output, things like that. Um, and 70% of Mexico uh, Mexicans fell be beneath the official uh, nation, uh, nationwide poverty line. Um, and it shouldn't surprise you, therefore, that 1995 and 1996 were two of the very highest years ever for migration across the Mexico-US border, both legally and, and without documentation. Um, and that was largely because of economic factors. Um, I had a teacher once in high school who told me, and I, I hold on to the idea because it's very sensible, um, happy people don't move. If you are content with where you are, you don't move. Moving is hard, moving is costly, moving is dangerous sometimes. So the fact that you have massive amounts of people migrating across the border in 95, 96, tells you that something is going on in Mexico, and this is what was going on. So, is NAFTA or was NAFTA a good thing for Mexico? Well, it's really hard for us to say, like I was alluding to before, it depends what metrics you're looking at. Um, it went into effect, of course, on January 1st of 1994. It reduced most tariffs on agricultural goods between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, that's what affected Mexico most was the agricultural goods. For the US, it tended to be manufactured goods. Um, it increased trade between our three countries by more than 500% between 93 and uh, 2012. So, like, if you're just looking for increased trade, yeah, that's a positive. But there are other metrics to look at as well, and I want to talk about them briefly in the next video.